on the coast in Monterey Bay, and I'm going to teach you about the four zones of the Rocky Inner Tidal. So the first zone is the splash zone, then we have the high zone, followed by the mid zone, and last but not least, the low zone. So we're gonna take a closer look at each of those zones, talking about the different types of algal and invertebrate species that you might find here, and a little bit about why these zones are important when we are studying the rocky intertidal habitats. All right, you ready to go? Come on with me. So looking at the different zones of the rocky intertidal, I'm gonna pan the camera to show you each zone, and then we'll zoom back into each zone to talk about uh, what things live in those zones and how the tides are affected in that area. So this first one is the splash zone air. So this is where most of the bare rock is. And then we're panning down and we're getting more into the high zone area. So less bare rock, more things that are covering it. So like we have scouring pad alga and uh, mussels and I can see some pythons and other things like that, barnacles. And then we're gonna pan down. And so for most of this part right here, this is the mid zone area. The mid zone is usually dominated by mussels. This is their prime habitat. You can see a couple of areas where there are bare rock, but for the most part, these are the mussel beds, so that's always a good indicator of the mid zone area. And then as we pan down, you can see that beautiful green stuff. So that's actually surf grass. And surf grass are uh, actually plants, they're not al algae, they actually are flowering plants. Plant but they are only found in those low zone area in what they call surf grass beds. And then as we pan out more, now we're getting into the actual tide pools area or subtidal pools here. And so here we have the splash zone area. So mostly bare rock, so only the highest of tides, mostly storm tides would ever be able to reach this uh, where they kind of splash and crash over. There's not much um, settling on this, so we don't see many uh, uh, species, so any, any snails or chitons, barnacles, any of that. Uh, splash zone areas are common areas for birds to uh, kind of haul out, hang out, get some rest uh, in between feeding and, and hunting, and also uh, using splash zone areas for nesting grounds as well. And so then we're going to kind of pan down and we're getting more into the high zone area. So this is the area where only the highest of the tides of the day come up to. Okay. Uh, so this is an area where the species that live in the high zone area are highly adapted to be able to be exposed to the elements uh, when they are not covered by water. So sometimes they can be out of water, exposed to the sun, exposed to the air uh, for you know six hours or so, uh, depending on um, the, the weather that day and the type of tide that we have. Uh, but you can see here we have a really common high zone algal species and so this is called scouring pad alga so it's an indicator that you're in the high zone area that's where they mostly dominate so they're well adapted to be exposed to the elements for long periods of time uh, we also have a bunch of limpets here if you can see sorry a little out of focus uh, we also have cat limpets and other things that can be here barnacles and then we're starting to get down from this high zone area uh, to the mid zone area. So now we're starting to get into all the muscle beds. All right, so remember I said that in the, case, the mid zone area. The mid zone area is probably the, one of the most stressful areas for any algal or vertebrate species to live in. That's because this is kind of the midway zone for the tides. Uh, so they are constantly uh, being uh, smacked by waves during the day that are coming up, whether they're coming up during the high tide or whether they're coming down during the low tide. So they're constantly having to deal with the waves in the water pounding against them. Uh, they're also exposed to the elements for a very long amounts of time during the tidal cycle. Uh, so a lot of these mid-zone species, so like right here, we're looking at the California mussel. Uh, they are shelled organisms, so they have those shells here that allow them to keep the, them from desiccating and to be able to hold hold in that that water and also um, are able to um, go without uh, a lot of oxygen for long amounts of time and then once they uh, are back in the water then these guys will actually open up and and start filter feeding okay. and so we also have some like turbine snails that's a common mid zone we have uh, you can see here these are 
pink acorn barnacles. They look like little volcanoes, very common ones here. We've got some limpets. Uh, somewhere underneath here, there's probably some shore crabs. They like to inhabit the mid-zone area as well. Uh, sea stars like to be in the mid-zone area. I don't see any right now. And some of the little tide pools, their main food source are mussels. Uh, but those are very common mid-zone species. Again, highly adapted uh, to live in a really stressful environment and having really cool adaptations, which we're going to talk about next week, uh, and seeing how they're able to survive with all of these stressors. You can see here also, sometimes in these little tide pools in the mid-zone area, you can see purple sea urchins. You can also see these lovely uh, giant green anemones as well. So they're a common mid-zone and low-zone species and all, some sunburst as well. Alright, so moving down from the mid-zone area, we're going to get down into the surfgrass bed. So they inhabit uh, the low-zone area. Alright, they're only found in the low-zone area. They actually provide a lot of habitat for a lot of different uh, species. Uh, so it kind of just looks like grass, like the grass that you cut um, on your lawn here. And we also have some other algal species that you find in the low zone area. So this is the area that isn't exposed to uh, the elements as long as the, the other zones that I just described. Uh, so these guys cannot uh, stay out exposed to the elements as long as other ones. Uh, so you have some other common low zone, uh, mid to low zone algal species. So this is iridescent algae. Uh, this stuff, if it's wet, is super slippery, so if you're ever out tide pulling, be aware not to step on this. Um, but the really cool adaptation for this one is they, they're rubber-like, so if you try to pull on them, they just snap back like a rubber band. We also have some coralline algae here as well. Uh, we have rockweeds. Rockweeds are a common mid to low zone uh, species. You can also find these guys up in the high zone area. So these guys are a little bit more adaptable and can be in different zones. And um, down here, we actually even have, if you can see, a beautiful sunburst anemone. And then, of course, as you go further out, then you are in the uh, tidal or subtidal area. So this is the area of the Rocky Intertidal that is always covered by water. Now that you know the zones of the Rocky Intertidal, you can see why they're so important for scientists to study because they are very defined areas that have specific species that live within the different zones. It's a great way for scientists to be able to track the health of these ecosystems and changes that are occurring within them over time. I hope you guys had a lot of fun today learning about the zones. I know I did. Be sure to check every Tuesday on the museum website for another video of exploring the coast with Hannah. Have a great day everyone.